what do you know of pain and sorrow? What do you know of a loveless tomorrow? I know of a man who love hath abandoned. An intelligent poet that love had branded. A man of the macabre, of horror, of woe. Tell me, naive viewer, what do you know of the man named Poe? With blooded quill in his hand, he wrote of ravens and death. His terrifying stories whispered low on one's breath. His tales are a curse that send shivers down your spine. For in them lies truth of the darkness inside. Although he is gone, his words of longing live on, beating through time as horror through rhyme. In the darkness of night, when the moon yields its light, his name's whispered low, the name of Edgar Allan Poe. Welcome to the History of the Box podcast. I am your host, Cam. And I'm Jen. And we are back again for yet another episode. We just can't stop making episodes no. about historic figures. Welcome to History of the Box podcast. We have an addiction to history. Yes. And people. Disclaimer. History, people. We are not historians. We are just simply Two individuals who have access to Google, yeah, the books, internet, yeah, and documentaries of all sorts. So we like to yeah. condense that all into a friendly hour-ish long episode for you to enjoy in your car, bathroom, wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Specifically in the bathroom. Uh, and with that being said, uh, as far as I know, we are the only history podcast that attempts to connect our listeners with the ghosts of their historical past. Whatever that means, no one knows. And no one else does it. Not, uh, one not a other, single person. Not one other historical podcast exists on this no. earth. So you're welcome. You're welcome. Doing the Lord's work here. And yeah, you're welcome in advance. Uh, if you like our content, you can find us at History Out of the Box on Instagram. I'm going to put it right here. Uh, make it really convenient visually. It's just a little Instagram logo there and then the name. It's not going to go that way. It's probably going to go this way, but Final Cut's weird. Anyway, uh, yeah. Um, you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, our audio comes out on Tuesdays and video on Wednesdays. So, yes. Hopefully yeah. you enjoy the intro. I'm getting very creative with these things. Yeah, they're they're fun. They're I'm not really accurate. It's all fiction. All of it. Actually, we just are coming off of an episode about Catherine the Great. We highly recommend after you listen to this one. Oh, uh, listen to that one. That was a good one. Sorry, this tea. Oh, and we're drinking tea. That's how that's how professional we are. Drinking tea while podcasting. Welcome to History Out of the Box. I am your host, Cam. I love tea. I was going to make Leather a poor attempt books. at a... Uh, British accent, but and that British probably would have been history. insulting and embarrassing for me. Yeah, it'd be cockneyed for you. Anyway, yeah. uh, who are we talking about today? Well, we were inspired this week by an incredible movie that we actually watched on the streaming platform known as Netflix. <laughs> and I know those are hits or misses when they're Netflix originals, but this, in this case, was it a Netflix original? I think it was. Um, maybe. Well, we watched the movie called Pale Blue Eye, which stars Christian Bale. You may know him from such movies such as Batman, Batman. yes, Batman, uh, American Psycho, and uh, Harry Melling, who you may or may not recognize his name, but he played Dudley Dursley in the Harry Potter series. And he is an excellent actor. I think he doesn't get enough credit. He really is. Yeah. It was really actually incredible. His performance was, not to say his other performances were bad. Those were very good too. But like hit that performance in that movie at that time when I watched it really held an it had an impact on me. Right. Well, that watching that movie, we were inspired to do today's historical figure. In this episode, we're diving into the life of one of America's most renowned authors and poets. He was an intelligent literary critic, and he was known for his dark and macabre stories and poems and uh, tales of mystery and the supernatural. So known for The Raven, uh, The Telltale Heart, or Tall Tale Heart, excuse me, uh, the Fall of the House of Usher. His works are American classics. And yeah, 
We're talking about the poet Edgar Allan Poe. So am I the only person in existence who thought for some reason that he was British my entire life until watching that movie? Really? Well, no, he wasn't British. He was I, I, like, I, like, it makes sense. Like, I look, I took like, I took, and this is unfortunate because I took like AP like classes and didn't have to take any lit classes in college. <laughs> uh, with that being said, like I was convinced for some reason, I don't know if it was just just thought he was British. Just, just because. To be like, frank, I never thought he was British. I, I think just I always seems just knew. like the Raven, doth the Raven. Like it just seems like he would be British for some reason. And then when we watch the pale blue eye, and he's very much American, very much Southern boy. I'm just like, what well, in the world is going on? Or it kind of a weird kind was, of Southernish accent. He was it's Boston, born, right? Yeah, he was born Boston. in the North, but he had some time in like Virginia and his life and stuff like that. Which, it was uh, an accent that I was like, actually, maybe had never heard before, which like was weird. A northeastern 1800s accent. Yeah. You know, I'm not even going to try. And well, I was just shocked. Uh, and look, ma- look, you're probably laughing, listeners, viewers, because all you guys know everything about the people. I get it. I don't. This is basically a show where Jen educates me on history. Um, I try. Yeah. Well, you, sometimes you not succeed. so well. Yeah. Well, you've kind of been very, for most of the people we've talked about. They've been OK. I think the only one I really really seriously dislike was l ron hubbard i mean he was terrible oh, yeah. um but uh no offense to all the l ron hubbard fans out there um but uh yeah no i just for some reason thought ed Allan poe was british no. i'm not sure why he's I, very much american but who was this man okay you're familiar with the name right you did learn about him a little bit in school yeah i read all of his stories yeah i think i had to read it in like have middle them. school or something Pretty like sure that we have them. what could explain his love for these dark tales and was his childhood you know disturbing or was his life disturbing in some way? And can you make sense of his mysterious death? 1800s creepypastas. They existed back then. He, he was in love with them as a child. And that's why he wrote what he wrote. Is Edgar Allan Poe the original creepypasta writer? Perhaps. Maybe he's the original creepypasta. You mm. ever think about that? Are you ready to hear about the life and works of Edgar Allan Poe? Yes, I am. Uh, a, a Halloween character, not in Halloween. Yes, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Edgar Allan Poe was born on January 19th, 1809 in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. And actually, you know, what's interesting is that means that January 19th, which is today, today, was actually, well, was, would have been his 214th birthday. Yeah, we actually planned that. That was just happened. We didn't, yeah. That was a... That was a happy surprise. So happy 214th birthday, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe. Frankly, I don't think I'm giving too much of a spoiler alert to say he's not here to celebrate today. Uh, he's so, dead. I don't think he cares. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, today would have been his birthday. Namaste, Mr. Poe. He was the second of three children born to Elizabeth, who was known as Eliza, Arnold Poe, and David Poe Jr., both actors. And he had an older brother named William and a younger sister named Rosalie. Again, you want to bring... His mom's middle name was Arnold? I think that was her maiden name. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was like, ooh, what a weird... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. Arnold... Go, going against uh, culturally appropriate feminine names. Okay, I guess you can do that. Then. Unfortunately, Poe's mother died of tuberculosis when he was just two years old in 1810. Rip Arthur Morgan. Oh, don't bring up Red Dead Redemption. Anyway. <laughs> His father actually turned out to be a real piece of work when he too, too decided that uh, he was going to abandon the family shortly after. I did see some things online that he may have left before his wife actually died, which... Um, turns out you're just a POS either way. <laughs> he, went, he, he went out for milk. Never came back. He just sucked. That's my hot take on this. But yes, uh, both of his parents, one died and the other took off. So Poe and his siblings were taken in by the Allen family. And they, these were merchants. That their names were John and Francis Allen. They were of Richmond, Virginia. And they actually were the ones who gave Edgar his middle name, Edgar Allen Poe. And... Little Edgar was never, him and his brother and sister were never formally adopted by the Allen family, Mm. but they were raised as though they were members of the family and they remained with them until their young adulthood. It seems that for the most part, their relationship was really good when he was a kid. Mm. So yeah, he was taken in and John Allen was Edgar's makeshift adoptive father. Uh, He was a very successive, successive, (laughs) successful tobacco cloth slave exporter you know oh the, the good stuff you do in the oh, early fun. 1800s That's in america great. yeah he had the finances and he had all the money to send edgar to some of the best boarding schools when he was very young 
these boarding See, schools were in places like London. That's probably why I thought he's British. Scotland. Well, he spent some time there for school, but he, that's probably he came why. back. Yeah. Like he spent most of his life. In Not America. sure why that stuck. It's still like really shocks me that that's stuck with me because it makes sense that he was, I mean, he's an American writer. So like, why did I think he was British for some reason? Anyway, it's okay. We were still a very young country back then. Yeah. This is, you know, the early 1800s, but Edgar was basically spoiled by, but also heavily disciplined by his father and, uh, or not his father, his makeshift father, father, uh, John Allen. Edgar did, uh, d- have a pretty difficult upbringing despite being quote spoiled by the Allen family. He was excelling academically. He was talented at writing from a very young age, but it turns out, uh, abandonment by a parent one way or another seems to leave its mark. So, yeah, that's kind of a thing. It's kind of a thing. Yeah, just a little bit. Now, because of John's ability to bankroll Edgar's studies, Edgar attended the University of Virginia to study ancient and modern languages for a very short time. However, in less than a year, Edgar was forced to drop out due to financial difficulties because, you see, he had a gambling problem. And John Allen flat out refused to pay off Edgar's debts. Well, let me preface this uh Edgar wrote to his family and said, you aren't paying enough for my schooling. I don't have enough money for the, oh my for God. the books and the stuff. And was you know, the- he, he was a rich, he was a rich kid. He was a rich, he was a rich New York, Brooklyn apartment child. Wasn't he? I mean, if you're going to equate it like that, he, he, perhaps. mommy and daddy's money. Well, it Let wasn't mommy and daddy, away. but kind of. Basically, he said, you need to pay. I need more money for school. You're not giving me enough money to pay for all these things I need for school. And then his debts continued to grow because he was gambling it all away. Yikes. Yeah. And and here's here's the thing, too. Uh, the University of Virginia was in its infancy at the time. It was founded on the principles of Thomas Jefferson, which prohibited alcohol and gambling and all sorts of stuff. But those rules were not really followed by the people who attended. It was sort of had the self-governance policy going on at the time. So had a very high dropout rate, very high because people just were out of control, I guess. You know? This was before the schools could wrangle you in into a long-term indentured servitude. The Allen family, once they found out about this gambling problem, refused to send him any more money to cover up Edgar's debts and, uh, yeah, he was a gambling addict through and through. So it turns out that relationship was on the rocks, so to speak. He tried to return home to R- Richmond, Virginia, but he felt a little guilty, I think. Plus, his childhood sweetheart had married someone else while he was partying it up in college. And his family was extremely disappointed in his behavior and the gambling problems. So he decided, I'm going to go off on my own, you know? fly away from the nest and figure it out. So he did the one thing so many men and women do when they aren't sure what to do next when they're young adults. They go to fight for Uncle Sam. That's right. He decided it was time to go and start his military career. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I never really kind of put together for some reason. Like some of the people we've talked about, like John F. Kennedy makes sense. Like, I went to fight in the war. Like that makes sense. Edgar Allan Poe, for some reason, just didn't ever strike me as someone who was in the military, and I'm not sure why. Well, I had a weird bias. Like, I had a very strange bias against Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And, like, a, mm-hmm. not, like, in a negative way. Like, I didn't think he was, like, a... I always, like, imagined him as, like, this old, like, decrepit, like, guy with a beard for some reason. I'm not sure why. I'm really not sure why. And, I like, he it's... He had a mustache. I don't think he, think he had a beard. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, like, I'm not sure, like... Because I, I was thinking about this before we, like, started recording. I was like, where did I get this from? Because it, it wasn't, like... Like I like imagine him as like for some reason like a, like a lighthouse manager like one he of really those guys wasn't. like that's what like it's like the it, I don't know why I imagine that like it just struck me as being a more appropriate image for Edgar Allan Poe. No, he <laughs> just was a, just a big old cloth over his shoulders wandering the light. <laughs> you know what I will say that in the Netflix movie Pale Blue Eye, he looks exactly like him without the, the mustache. Looks but yes, exactly like him he does and from what i can tell looking into his life his like real life because that that movie is a work of fiction it's not necessarily based off anything that actually happened in edgar Allan poe's life just he's a character in the movie um they really nailed his his character as in his like personality and how he seemed to act with other people yeah it was very it was very interesting um yeah i don't know i just i just had some weird imagery 
for me for mm-hmm. Edgar Allan Poe. I, maybe I like got it confused with somebody else. Well, maybe when we get past his military career and you can see how things change, maybe it'll make more sense. It just, to you. Like, it just makes sense for him to be like the manager of a lighthouse in Maine for some reason. Talking probably about, would have been better suited. Like just with a nasty beard, a blanket wrapped around his shoulders, wandering the shores late at night in the mist. You know? A that, raven! Ah! I mean, <laughs> like someone like I discovers said, his writing. That's, that's a dream job for some people. Isn't there like a lighthouse? Didn't we watch something about a lighthouse? Wasn't there like the, isn't, wasn't there a movie or is this like a real thing where there's the like a lighthouse in the middle? The no, no, I'm not talking about that one. I'm not talking about that one with Shovel Face and Green Goblin. I'm talking about that one, the one where like there's an actual lighthouse somewhere in like in the middle of nowhere and they pay you a ton of money to manage it. And I can't remember. I'm sure there's many. There's yeah. many lighthouses Maybe in the middle. Maybe in Canada and Nova Scotia that I was reading about. But um, yeah, anyway. You're probably thinking about Back on topic. This. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Edgar Allan Poe. No more lighthouses. No. Although that's probably a really way good more story. fitting for his image. I'm just saying. So Poe decided to enlist in the United States Army May of 1827. And he was 22 years old at the time, but he or well, he said he was 22 years old at the time, but he was actually 18. And he enlisted under the name Edgar A. Perry. His first job in in the army was serving at Fort Independent in the Boston Harbor. And he was paid five dollars a month. Why did he change his name? Well, why did he change his age and name? He uh, he just was under. Could you under, not be a military undercover. person in at eighteen? Then, pretty sure you could. I don't know. He just he just changed it up. I don't know exactly why he did that. This I goes could. back to the thing I've said in like other episodes and other podcasts. Sister podcast, shout out uh, Wolf and Bull. Uh, it, it, there are no rules. There are still no rules. Just we all pretend there are. Anyway, yeah. Well, if you have enough money, there's no rules for you either today. No rules. Just have to have enough money. <laughs> but uh, this is when he started taking writing pretty seriously. He actually published his first book. It was all more of like a like a collection of poems called Tamerlane and Other Poems, published in 1827 under the pseudonym A Bostonian. Wait, all a rough Tamerland and minor poems. I think you skipped ahead. Oh. Because that's the second one he published. I did. All are off Tom I did skip ahead. Well, that was the second one, guys. Yeah. <laughs> These publications were not very popular. In fact, even though he was cultivating his love for writing, he only published about 50 copies of these. But can you imagine today getting your hands How on one of those? They would be worth. I don't know if they're even out there, but if they are, I'm sure they are worth a pretty penny. They've got to be somewhere. Maybe. Like, just in some old, like, Someone's grandma's attic. attic. They're, like, using it as, like, a... You want like some a, cookies? You know. A coaster for their coffee. They're and one like, kid goes up there and like digs through some of the boxes and next to all like the haunted crap, like his one copy is there, picks it up, reads it. This is lame, crumples it, throws I it away. I really don't know. I, I'm kind of curious if they have any. They have. They if have they to. do, some museums probably, you got it. That's a question I've always box. had is like how, like if you find something like that, like something incredibly rare and expensive, like how, what is the compensation? Do they compensate you or do you just kind of, Give it to them for free. Um, some, like pay some donate it, but a lot of museum museum curate items and they do pay for them. But think about it. You have to pay to go into a lot of museums, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't think they have any original copies. I'm looking. Original copies? No. Jeez. I don't think so. That was wild. But yeah, there was only a few. You can buy it, though, if you want to on Amazon. You know, get the new, the 2023 version <laughs> that was printed. Uh, but yeah, crazy. That was when he started writing. Was not popular. Okay, so you gotta start somewhere, though. Uh, but his monthly pay was doubled when he was posted in South Carolina instead and pr- uh, promoted to an what's called an artificier. Am I saying that right? Artificer. Okay, I tried. I'm sorry. Every time we do an episode, I, I end a few up words. pronouncing a so couple good. words wrong. I really do. I mean, try you're, my you're saying about eight thousand words an episode. So, I mean. <laughs> so the, these individuals, what he was promoted to, they would actually prepare shells for artillery, and uh, he worked his way to the post of sergeant major of artillery, and then he decided he wanted out. Mm. Yeah, get ready. He took drastic measures to get out. He actually wanted to end his five year contract, so he went to his commanding officer. He told them his real name, Edgar Allan Poe, and he explained his financial situation. You know, my family, they've basically cut me off. It's just bad, blah, blah, blah. So the commanding officer said, okay, Poe, Edgar, we will discharge you with the blessing of John Allen. Uh, And Poe was like, "Uh, how am I supposed to get his blessing? He's really mad at me because I basically gambled all the money away that I was supposed to go to college with. So he started writing John Allen 
writing him, basically begging for his blessing to do this. And John ignored him for months, just ignored him. At the time, Frances Allen, who was John Allen's wife and the makeshift, you know, adoptive mother for Edgar, was getting sick. And then she eventually passed away. Edgar showed up right after she passed away. So he didn't really get a chance to say goodbye. And it seems that her death kind of softened the heart of John Allen a little bit to Edgar because he was mad at him. He was mad. But uh, he decided, okay, you can go through with this discharge, this discharge from the army under the condition that you go straight to West Point. Which Shop is in the heart, or he was emotionally distraught. No yeah. one knows. Yeah, it's a uh, he changed his mind. You can go right out of the military straight into a military academy. That's right. Mm-hmm. So Poe was officially discharged from the army in 1829. He went straight to the United States Military Academy in New York. Uh, actually, it was the following summer in 1830, but. Without the financial backing of the Allen family, he had to leave West Point as well. And I think you're wondering, wait a second. I thought John Allen said he had to go straight to West Point in order to be discharged from the army. Well, here's what happened between then and now at this point in his life. John Allen had remarried and the second marriage had soured the relationship between John and Edgar. Yes. And... Alan also had been having repeated affairs and children out of wedlock. And basically all of this stuff really made Edgar Allan Poe very upset. So their relationship was basically done. And the Allen family officially disowned Edgar Allan Poe at this point. So Edgar decided some retaliation. What did he do? Story. Did he write a terrible poem about them? Did he, I don't know, go and egg their house? Did he toilet paper? Did he teepee their trees? Do kids even do that anymore? Um, what did know. what did he do? He decided to purposely get court martialed. He decided to get himself court martialed as retaliation to the Allen family. Yeah. How does that make any sense? I don't know. So I'm really his way of saying f you. I'm mad, Dad. I'm gonna go get myself put in jail. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Well, on February 8th of 1831, Poe was found guilty of gross neglect and disobedience of orders for refusing to retend formations, classes, church, all these things at West Point, and he was technically kicked out of the military academy because of this. So yeah, it was time to move on. And Edgar couldn't go back with the Allen family who had raised him from the time he was two. Oh, no. He decided instead to move in with his actual aunt, Maria Clem, and her young daughter, Virginia Eliza Clem, in Baltimore, Maryland. This guy's had a turbulent life so uh, Well, far. It, it, it stays turbulent. Warning. It's just turbulent life all the way around. Okay. This part's going to be fun. I'm just prepping you. I'm not even going to, no spoiler. Just jump into it. Just We're going to go. Go into okay. it. Focus solely on his greatest love of writing. Edgar started to gain some traction in that area. He was actually uh, dealing with, there was at this point in American history, publishers were often producing unauthorized copies of European literature and British works at the time, rather than paying for American authors to make new stuff because there was no international copyright law. So basically they could take anything written that I'm very much like, What's you're, the word? I'm broad stroking broad it stroking. and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm watering it down a lot. But think of it as they could take works from British authors, authors and publish them in America under their name because wow. there was no copyright law internationally. So, well, now it's way too far the other way <laughs> to where pendulum has swung. Mickey Mouse will never be able to have something even created remotely like him until the year 3047. Yeah. So yeah, good old Mickey. Yeah. Things have changed. But it was hard out there for American authors is basically what I'm saying because American publishers didn't want to they they could just take anything from the British and just republish. I mean, but it. what is anything that we create? It's all just replicated nonsense for the continual generations of humanity that have all heard the same similar stories over and over again. Except yeah. this podcast, we are 100% original. Oh, that's right. But in 1835 Edgar, his Aunt Maria, and his young cousin Virginia actually picked up and moved to Richmond, Virginia, where Poe took a job as the editor for the Southern Literary Messenger. And Poe was financially providing for his aunt and her family 
Luckily, actually, he was able to talk his way back into the job because soon after he got it, he was fired for being drunk on the job. So we have gambling and drinking as a common theme throughout his life. This guy was American through and through. That's right. My British observations were sorely wrong. But like so many people we've talked about on this show, Poe had taken a liking to his dear young cousin, his 13-year-old cousin. It doesn't get much better from here, so I would just prepare yourself. Um, You heard that right. 27-year-old Edgar Allan Poe married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia Eliza Clem, on May 16, 1836. In Richmond, under the eyes of Reverend Amasa Converse, she was listed on the marriage license as 21 years old, and that age was confirmed via affidavit. They were whisked away on their honeymoon in Petersburg, Virginia. Yeah. Well, and what? let me say, before you say anything, before you say anything, some biographers actually speculate on the actual nature of the relationship. I don't like it still, regardless of any of these speculations. Um, some historians actually consider their relationship as being more of a brother sister thing and not like sexual or romantic in nature. Did he? Ever but I'm have not sure about that. Any children? No, no children. Uh, actually, uh, part of this is in writings. He would sometimes refer to his wife as sis or sissy, which kind of weird. <laughs> regardless of how you look at it. And there's no evidence one way or the other. Some speculate there was never any consummation of the marriage in the first place. How would they know? I know, I know. And some speculate that Poe was not even sexually interested in women, that he sort of saw them as a muse for his writing. Again, how do you know? Here's the thing. Well, wait, wait, wait. Before you say anything, regardless of everything I just said, some of his friends would say that they had a very platonic marriage no, or however you can say that until she was 16 and then they lived as a normal happy married couple so take that for what you will the bottom line is that 13 year old <laughs> okay 13 year old virginia clem you want to talk about bottom line married 27 year old edgar Allan poe her cousin her first cousin we're not talking distant. Even Catherine the Great married her second cousin. <laughs> this is this is what? the first cousin. Think of your first cousin right now. What is and the... now imagine them being thirteen? <laughs> We're not. Okay. This episode's never monetized. Uh, Will never be monetized. What? What? Why? Why? Okay. Why? 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 Well, okay. Why is it always why? Listen. No. <laughs> no 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 so she? many people talk about how like back in the day everyone used to get married when they were so young and i'm like yeah because they're all blinking their cousins she, that was their first option she was 13 years old okay. she was three years younger than me I, mean, I would be more lenient towards thinking okay maybe he was trying to financially protect do i need them. to do another chris hansen intro I did, do we need to have another? I was going to be like this Maybe. intro. I mean, because here's the thing that people don't know this. The intro that you're watching that you've seen before this, this is it's done in post. I do it after the show. Do I need to do another one? Really? Listen. Overused. Listen. We can't use his likeness. Listen for a second. Listen, listen, listen. I would be more slightly like if it was 100%, I'd be 1% understanding if it was like they were in dire financial straits and he was trying his best to keep them from like being homeless under a bridge however (laughs) stick with me on this okay stick with me stick with me i'm going to explain something to you which makes me a little more uh, eek eek virginia's half sister's husband named nielsen poe who was another cousin of poe's heard that poe was interested in marrying little young 13 year old virginia and nielsen made some attempts, it seems, to stop this marriage from happening by offering to have the young girl sent away for a better education, etc. And he basically implied like, okay, if you really want to get married to her when she's older, fine, but not now, right? Edgar heard about this and flipped out. And he wrote an emotional letter to his aunt, Virginia's mom, 
He wrote a letter August of 1835, basically begging his aunt to let young Virginia make the decision herself instead of sending her away. She's a child. You can read this letter right now if you want. It's available on the internet. Okay. That. You know what? You, he, you know what? I, you know what? I, I, he, this, this, uh, wait, 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 wait. Pause, pause. This show. It's about it's it's about understanding. It's about understanding. It's about it's about giving giving an image, looking at people in a light. I will remove my bias. I'll put it in my here's my here is my bias. I'm fold it up and put it in my pocket. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, just continue. Just go. Yeah. So he basically begged uh, his aunt not to to send her daughter away and to let. 13-year-old girl decide whether she wanted to marry her 27-year-old cousin or not. That's what happened. He actually said that he was, uh, and he wrote in the letter that he was being brought to tears by his frustration with the situation. And um, he actually called his cousin, his other cousin, Nielsen, the one who was kind of trying to like push the marriage off until she was older. He called, <laughs> he called him his bitterest enemy. <laughs> and he was also a owner of a newspaper in Baltimore. So maybe it had to do with that being a literary, you know, person over here. He didn't nope. want to deal with. Nope. Nope. But nope. the theatrics, nope. the theatrics of this man, all the historians that speculate. Shame on you. Shame on you. It's pretty, because I mean, listen, it's uh, gross. I'm it, sorry. Why? I don't like it. Why would you write a letter Asking for a 13 year old to decide. Look, I'm, I'm sure that there are maybe some people who know more about Edgar Allan Poe than we do who might have some reasons or reasons or reasons or reasons. Which is On their its face, I don't like own it. Okay? That's, opinion and, this is mine. and bias and, this is yours. and interpretation, just like ours. So my whole thing is look, if you want to think that, fine. But I've always been of the belief that humans, very similar. Over the generations, we really don't change that much. And if in today's context, it's a little strange, then it's probably a lot strange back then. Just a little bit. Just yeah. a little, just a little, little bit. Well, while in holy man- matrimony with uh, his 13-year-old uh, cousin, Edgar was editing literary journals left and right. And he was. He was uh, editing for the Gentleman's Magazine, Graham's Magazine in Philadelphia. How to become husband to my 13-year-old cousin the magazine. Broadway Journal LTD. in New York City. And soon thereafter came some of his most famous work, the publication of The Raven, The Telltale Heart. These tales, along with some of others, like The Fall of the Usher, uh, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Fall of Usher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really big a few years ago. Now I produce music. How come I can't think of one song? My boo. It's <laughs> the one Usher song I get. Yeah. Of. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. there you go. There you go. Anyway, That's all I know from that song. These stories cemented Poe's reputation as a master of the macabre and the supernatural. And the swaying the hearts of young 13-year-old cousins everywhere. So um, I know you probably need a little palate cleanser after something like that. So. I drank all my tea. My tea that tastes like dirt. Yeah. Well, so, my dirt tea. So give yourself a second. Take a few breaths. Let's do a commercial break. And we're back. Yeah. I don't think that palate cleanser worked over there for Cam. He's still upset. He's still disturbed. There's so many other, there's so many, so many other options. There's so many. There, look, maybe not, maybe not to the extent of now, because now there's like an oversaturation, according to some people. Uh, oversaturation. But there are so, I'm sure, that Mr. Poe, with all of his sultry, smooth talking, could have found someone his age. Yeah, I'm sure he could. Or maybe, like, 18. Well, here's the thing. He, you'll find out. Uh, he seemed, by by all accounts, and we'll talk about it more, he, like, seemed to really, in whatever way you can, absolutely adore Virginia. The state? Loved, yeah, me too. No, the no, state's his beautiful. his wife and his cousin. I bet he did. Yeah, his cousin wife. His, his wasn't. <laughs> let's talk about. His kife. Let's talk about Edgar's attempt. Wasn't? his attempt at a political career. Oh God. That's this right, might then. make you laugh in a sad way. Between 1841 and 1842, 
Edgar was trying to earn a position in President John Tyler's administration, who was, pre- you know, President of the United States at the yeah. time. Poe claimed to be a member of the Whig Party. Whether this is true, I have no idea. He didn't seem like the most political guy, just kind of, you know, he had other things to care about, like his, his cousin. Wasn't <laughs> his wife cousin. Uh, but maybe, probably not. I don't know if he was very political, but he wanted to be in the cabinet or in the administration in some part. So he was friends of a friend of a friend. His friend's name was Frederick Thomas, who knew a guy who knew a guy who happened to be President Tyler's son, who was named Robert. And apparently this job, this appointment that Poe wanted was actually a real possibility and opportunity for him because everyone knows money and connections are all you need to get into politics. I keep saying that. I think it's something. It's literally something that you can just buy into. It's like it's almost like a just a really expensive lottery ticket. You just show up and be like, I have the money for this position and then throw it down. And then if you get a marketing campaign or back then uh, just enough cousins around you to to support you, then you can you can make your way in this country. Not to say there aren't people who maybe don't have those things who actually make their way into politics. I'm just saying it sure helps. Okay, you know, I've just come to believe that there's not. Look. Are there some lucky ones? Sure, maybe. Is it all predestined? No, it's not. Yeah, but well, if you get enough cousins, <laughs> put them in a pile together with you to support you, and if you happen to know a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who's a guy of your friend, then you can have a very successful political career. Well, here's the thing. Just got to stack the cousins up. Edgar Allan Poe was his own worst freaking enemy when it came to this because he was supposed to meet up with his buddy Thomas to discuss the future of this career opportunity and uh poe on you know right before it was supposed to happen said he had fallen ill but likely from what his friend thomas says he was actually just very drunk so he missed the meeting of a lifetime he was still quote promised a position but he never got it they were all full by that point so yeah you heard it here first maybe maybe not first but you heard it here edgar Allan poe missed his shot because he got drunk. Probably for the best. At least that's what's speculated to have happened. Could he have been really sick? Maybe. But here's the thing. Um, he This wouldn't be the first time that being drunk has uh, ruined some opportunities in his life. So Unfortunate. This is where I say don't ever drink, even though... <laughs> I'm sure his wasn was there to console him. <laughs> drink safely. That's how I'll say it. And don't miss your opportunities because you got drunk. <laughs> but let's talk about Scandal. I mean, oh, we haven't one. talked about a That's negative. Great. We haven't talked about enough, enough negative things in his life. <sighs> you know what's uh, so unbelievably difficult? So unbelievably difficult about this show is that it ruins my interpretation. You of thought people. he was some British. I guy. thought he was a British lighthouse supervisor. Okay, let me also and say now. Now I can't ever not imagine him as someone who is very close to his wife who's his cousin okay let me tell you this edgar Allan poe has a lot of good bad and ugly in his life and no matter what you hear here here today you should check out his works because they're very good yes and yeah, uh, his works are great his sometimes art yeah you know i'm someone who personally and you may agree with me or not i like to separate the art from the artist for the most part sometimes it's harder than others I mean, look, it's, it's, there's nothing. No one, no one has a perfect score, it seems. No. Like I can find something I dislike about it. Yeah, it's not. No, I'm not looking for him to have a perfect score. And honestly, historically, I'm not, I'm not really that surprised. It's just, ah. Uh. Well, here's one thing you should know. Edgar Allan Poe is long dead. So he is not financially benefiting from you reading his books if you don't like him. 214 years long dead. So, scandal time. Great. Edgar Allan Poe was at the very least a major flirt. I bet. In 1845, Edgar was caught flirting with a married 34-year-old poet named Francis Sargent Osgood. They were just friends. So we think? I don't think. Was Francis a woman? Yes. Oh. Woman. Sorry, I'm still stuck on JFK. Anyway. She has a husband. Yeah. But they're having a little flirtationship, as one would say. Good old Lem, whatever his name is. What? JFK's best buddy oh, friend. Oh, no, 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 no. Spent rooms This is a in. woman. Wives don't typically like when their husbands are flirting with other women, regardless of whatever situational thing you've got going on. Speaking as a wife myself, typically it doesn't go over very well, I would imagine. Okay? 
Am I wrong? I don't know. Just ask all the weird, awkward commercials that we've gotten while listening to podcasts huh? of the, what was the one thing we were moving here where it was oh, like this commercial right. for like a polygamy. Yeah. We're going to keep it at that. And we'll definitely not monetize uh, now. Yeah. yeah. Wives don't typically like this is what I'm going to say. No. Okay. Um, it seems that young Virginia, remember, this is a very young woman. She um, seemed to be <clears throat> in denial. She's a kid. She was in denial. How old is she here? Uh, 1845. She's, she's probably 22, 22, 21. She's a child. Yeah, she seemed to be in a little bit in denial. She actually invited this woman over a lot, would have her over for dinner. Oh, no. And it seemed that she seemed to like her because Poe would promise not to drink or use any stimulants around Francis, and that really encouraged Virginia. Stimulants. Wow. Whatever that means. So it seemed like this older woman was a good influence on her husband. So Virginia kind of liked having her around, at least at first. And it turns out that another woman, the third woman here, had eyes on Poe. And she could see what Virginia couldn't. That Poe obviously had something with this Miss Osgood. Okay. And the allure that... Francis had on Poe was plain as day to this third woman. This third woman was named Elizabeth F. Ellett. I believe that's how you pronounce her last name. E-L-L-E-T. I don't think I need to say L-A. I'm pretty sure it's Ellett. We're just going to go with the American English pronunciation. Uh, This was another poet. All these poets. All these just... You know, freaky poets, okay? What's up with you guys? <laughs> but Edgar referred to Elizabeth in negative terms. He would actually like write about her in a letter to someone, and he was so annoyed with her because she would, like, she was just obsessed with him, but he would still publish her works in the journal he was working at regardless. So it was kind of like this weird playing on top of her feelings, but also annoyed by her, but also like, who knows? It just. It's a lot of walk in the line here. You know, whether it went too far or not, doesn't doesn't look too good. But he uh, <laughs> he had another problem. Elizabeth Ellett was a troublemaker. A big troublemaker. And while visiting Poe's home one day, she actually found one of Francis Osgood's personal letter- letters to Edgar. And she started stirring up some ish with Poe's wife, Virginia and Francis Osgood and Edgar. And then she brought in the husband of Francis into it. And it was, I'm not going to go too in depth because it was like really complicated, but it ended up being a whole mess. Like Edgar was trying to fight his friend over these letters because she was accusing him of, of taking it too far. And he was like, she's making it up, but I know I'm kind of guilty of taking it a little too far. (sighs) And basically Elizabeth took it to the papers And then she started saying that Edgar Allan Poe was in and out of insane asylums and his friends all thought he was crazy. So the headlines started running about Edgar Allan Poe being insane because he, yeah. This is why, look, (laughs) I don't know why some individuals, look, it's, it's their lives. They can do what they want. I can't tell them what to do. But this part, this right here, albeit extreme, is exactly why. One, one, one. One's enough. There was a little bit of a slight love triangle with a lot of really dramatic, vindictive people at the middle of it who were just trying to get everyone at each other. Is dramatic, and everyone is vindictive. So there's like you can't get away. You're messing with a whirlwind of pain and violence. Yeah, artists. But here's the thing: Virginia caught the full wind of all of this, and remember, she's a young. I'm going to say almost a young girl. She's a very young woman. And she was being sent anonymous letters by the point that the the media got wind of everything. She was getting tons of mail about her husband's actions, alleged indiscretions, just whether true or not true was just bombarding her. And whether she was romantically involved with her husband or not, I still imagine that this is just crushing like the weight of all of this is disturbingly crushing and it apparently had quite the toll on her mental health and we'll see how that resulted actually very shortly thereafter. So, I'm going to say it right now for the record. This is my least favorite one. It doesn't get much better. Either. I can't make any jokes. I can't do anything but sit here uncomfortable. Well, as you can see, this was a mess 
It was just a mess in their lives. And Poe had a life that was kind of personally affected by tragedy and plagued with all these issues all the time. So it didn't get much better when on January 30th, 1847, after a couple years long battle with tuberculosis, his 24 year old wife, Virginia, died in uh, New York at their family's cottage. TB was a real pain in the bum. For those who are unfamiliar with TB or tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. That's what I just said. What did I say? Tuberculosis. Oh, sorry. (laughs) It's hard. Hard words. TB. Uh, Most of us are probably, most of us, I don't know, are probably vaccinated against it. It's pretty commonly um, vaccinated when you're a child at this point. But basically, this bacterium affects the lungs, mm-hmm. other areas too. But you have a horrible cough, chest pain, difficulty breathing. If it's not treated, you usually die. Um, and back yeah, you in the drown, day, you drown in your own um, biological fluids. Yeah, if that makes sense. Unfortunately, at this time in history, it was extremely common. If you watch movies that are kind of based around this time, there's always someone in the movie who has TB. They call it consumption a lot. You ever play Red Dead Redemption? Arthur Morgan died from it. Yeah, yeah. And it was spread Good through coughing. Arthur Morgan. Coughing and sneezing. and ugh. Yeah, very sad. So Virginia passed away at 24 years old of tuberculosis. And I believe like Sacagawea, didn't she pass away? Of it, tuberculosis. According to that one thing. Tuberculosis, yes. I can't, Am I saying it wrong yes. again? Tuberculosis. <sighs> Hard words. Tuber- on her did. deathbed. Supposedly, yeah. Yeah, supposedly. But on her deathbed, Virginia accused no other than Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ellett of murdering her. This is likely due to the scandal involving Poe just causing so much mental anguish that Virginia sort of blamed her for not being able to physically get better because she was so upset about everything that happened so yeah i mean did she really murder her i mean probably not (laughs) she was very sick with tb but yeah goes to say that uh one's mental health typically has a big effect on their lives and at the very least virginia was very upset about that she she should have took some mental health days nice if only she worked for Alphabet. That's the only joke I can come up with because everything else is depressing. Let's continue. <laughs> Poe struggled with alcoholism throughout his Great. entire life. And he was often in poor health because of this. Ugh. Alcohol usually does not do very good things for your health. Uh, he reportedly had untreated mental health issues, which so many people did at the time because I don't think there was a lot of psychologists or psychiatrists <laughs> around for everyone to have accessibility to but well, back then they would you know open up your skull cap and yeah, poke around give you a lobotomy oh ah, you're fine you can't talk anymore you're cured yeah i mean these problems probably extended back to his gambling days at university and probably before like i said in my personal opinion this is my opinion abandoning a child has effects so all the time would he have been a better poet yeah, some may Without say he wouldn't have been. Without alcohol. I've heard, uh, what, what was the the quote I've heard before? Something about some of the best, I, I've heard it in particular with comedians. Some of the best comedians are the ones who've had like the darkest like pasts. Well, that's what comedy is. It's, that's, why, that's why it's so bad that people are trying to get rid of comedy because it's an outlet for, for trauma. So mm. yeah, but I, my whole thing is like, would he have been a really good poet? had he have not had some of the juice or would he have been even better if he could have controlled the juice well it's a question we have to ask all of ourselves yeah that is a good question i mean he's a great writer but yeah that he went through some stuff yeah, well his wasn't just died so <clears throat> I get him having to deal with that virginia's death seemed to spur on all of these mental health issues his alcoholism got worse and it was kind of spiraling out of control. He was turning to the bottle to cope with his wife's death. Uh, this illness seemed to have deeply, deep, deeply, deeply, deeply affected his prose. <laughs> Sorry. Deeply. <laughs> deeply, you saw it. Jinkies. Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> Sorry. of. Um, it's said that actually Virginia told Edgar right before her death that she would be his guardian angel. Um. Yeah, so think what you will about their marriage. But uh, by most accounts, pretty much all accounts I could find, regardless of the wife-cousin thing, uh, everyone said they had a really good marriage. 
I mean, I don't think it like impact. Well, it probably does impact like relational things. I'm just saying, like, I just I don't. Eh. There's just so many other things, so many other options. He would regularly visit her grave, and he, he would try and court several other women after she died. But um, even Frances Osgood, remember her? She even said that Virginia was the only woman that he ever loved, and. He had reportedly been engaged with another poet named Sarah Hella Whitman after Virginia died, but it fell apart due to his erratic behavior, frequent drunkenness. Her mother was like, uh uh-uh, uh, you're not marrying this nut. So this and guy was he was just busted. Yeah. He was just busted. He was a tragic poet, a he tortured was busted. soul. And uh yeah, some speculate that Virginia actually died a virgin. So How I don't do know. You no. Know? You don't You don't. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Well, we only know what friends of friends of friends said. Let's wrote talk down. about Edgar Allan Poe's creepy death. Yeah, this one's interesting. He died under mysterious circumstances in 1849 at the age of 40 years old. Edgar had returned to Richmond for a brief spell, and then he was heading out to Philadelphia for an editing job on September 27th, 1849. To this day, no one is sure why, but he paused on his journey to Philadelphia and stopped in Baltimore. There, it's no account of what he was actually doing for almost a full week. On October 3rd, 1849, Edgar Allan Poe was discovered by Joseph W. Walker in what was called a state of semi-consciousness at 5 a.m. in the morning at a place called Ryan's Tavern. Walker said that Poe could not explain what he was doing there. He had no explanation for why he was wearing clothes that did not belong to him, and he asked him to reach out to an acquaintance of his. His name was Joseph R. Snodgrass. (laughs) Great name. (laughs) Freaking names. Snodgrass arrived and stated that Poe's clothes were too large and unkept. It was very unlike Poe to be like this. And his body and hair, he looked horrible. He smelled bad. He was acting weird. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He did say that he seemed to be drunk, but we're not quite sure. There's varying accounts of this. It was just out of character for Poe to be in this situation. Poe was rushed to Washington College Hospital and contained in what is essentially a drunk ward. It's basically a windowless ward where no visitors are allowed. And his personal, his physician came. Four days later, on October 7th, 1849, he was pronounced dead. And the cause of death was determined as acute congestion of the brain. What does that mean? He had been calling out the name Reynolds repeatedly on the night of his death, and no one knows who that is. His last words, according to his physician, remember, his personal physician was there, John Joseph Moron, were, Lord, help my poor soul. His death certificate has been lost to time. And this Dr. Moron has been questioned to his credibility as he gave different dates of death and different final last words. Did Dr. Moran kill him? He (laughs) may have been a moron, (laughs) but... Moran. Moran? Did he (laughs) moronically murder Edgar Allan Poe? The cause of death is still debated. Theories range from alcoholism to tuberculosis to murder to suicide. And uh, it seems that some medical practitioners actually reopened this case after he had died. And they speculated he may have had rabies. He may have had syphilis. It's all very highly disputed, and no one's really settled on an answer. On he what may have happened. been murdered by aliens. He might have been stabbed by Bigfoot. He might have been shot out of a cannon over the Grand Canyon and crumpled into a bundle. We're not sure how he died. We just know that he did. There just seems to be no account of where he was for for almost a week and why he was in that. I believe it was uh, Baltimore. Why he was Deaders? in debtors. Mm-hmm. There's no reason he was supposed to be in Baltimore. He was going to Philadelphia. And he was... No one seems to have said where he was. No one talked to him. No one spoke out. No one said anything. So wait a sec. But he was found outside a bar, a tavern. So we can... His stuff, by the way... We can speculate whether he... 
and his wasn got frisky. His wife cousin. She was dead by this point. Or, oh, but we can't speculate on how he passed outside of acute congestion of the brain, which to me sounds like uh, abnormal digestion of the heart. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it really doesn't make sense. Plus, you know, okay, he gets, let's just say he was belligerently junk when they found him. Four days later, he dies. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Well, poison, I mean, that, Some that's think a he may long, have been Some that's think- a long, long turnaround for poison. I mean, is it there, are there poisons out there that take four days? I don't know. But yeah, the long strange. lasting poison like this poison. Open the bottle. This poison actually works very slowly. <laughs> 48 hour, 70, 184 hour, 112 hour turnaround. Like, I mean, like it doesn't. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's weird. His death was very odd. And you no, know, going as far as saying he had rabies. Hmm. Interesting. Right? What was my math there? 96 hours, 112. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. Edgar Allan Poe was buried with his wife, Virginia, and his mother-in-law, Maria, and the funeral had very few people attending. Just a simple coffin, and Edgar Allan Poe was in the ground. Was he? Are we sure that he was actually buried? Yeah, we're sure he was buried. He's actually buried twice. He was buried in one place at first, and then he was moved later to be with his wife. Did a grassy knoll have to play into the sequence? There was no grassy knoll, as far as I know. But, yeah, he was found in front of a tavern. Oh, and I didn't even mention his stuff, like his bags, was in a different city. Mm-hmm. At he a owed someone. Tavern. It was debtors. He had been a, It had to have been debtors. Maybe. It had to have been debtors, and they gave him the short-acting poison, long-acting poison, which should have acted shortly, but instead acted longly. His body fought. His for body four fought days. for vigil- 96 hours, vigil- vigilantly fought, and then he succumbed to the the terrible determinants of Dr. Moran. I know. Sorry, Moran. Sorry, Doctor. You're <laughs> he's, dead. He's too, dead. So. <laughs> he <cares. laughs> he's dead too. We're this not isn't quite about done Poe. Yet. This isn't about Dr. Moran, okay? Well, even though he's now passed on, we're not done talking about Poe. Because shortly after his death, character assassination was in play. His literary rival, whose name was Rufus Wilmot Griswold. (laughs) Quite the name. Rufus Wilmot Griswold. (laughs) He decided that now was the best time to be an evil little gremlin. That's my opinion. These (laughs) these names. That's a pretty great name. Rufus Wilmont Griswold. Uh, that's what I'm going to be for Halloween next year. You got to get a monocle and a top hat. I am Rufus Wilmont Griswold. So under a pseudonym, Griswold published a high profile obituary that tore Poe to shreds, basically cast him as a lunatic. The New York Tribune published it and then spread it throughout the country. And if you think I'm being harsh to Griswold, Come. let me have Cam read to you how it started. Edgar Allan Poe is dead. He died in Baltimore the day before yesterday. This announcement will startle many, but few will be grieved by it. That was the obituary in the paper for Edgar Allan Poe. The Griswold gremlin made it his mission to slander Poe and his works through the mud after the man was dead and it could no longer defend himself. Okay, I maybe am being a little harsh with the gremlin talk. It just was so perfect. Griswold gremlin, it just worked. That was his you know? nickname. But he really made it a mission to just ruin Poe's, like, character after he was There's dead. a lot of people that did that. Christopher Columbus had people that did that during his time, which is actually why a lot of people think he was a terrible POS. And he kind of was. We should do him eventually. <laughs> like, well. He kind of was, but there were actually some things about him that were actually interesting. But we should eventually talk about him because that's a fun one. Good, bad, and ugly, for Not sure. Not now or in the immediate future because no. the next person we're talking about is also Spooks. Yes. But... Just kind of similar. Griswold actually published a biography about Poe, and he presented a long list of historical and scholarly information that was actually taken as like an accurate biography that just ripped him apart until later it was proven that Griswold's letters that he had shown as proof of his accusations were complete forgeries he had made up himself. It seems to happen a lot Some yeah. for some reason. It seems to... Happen a lot. So here's the thing. Regardless of what you think about Edgar Allan Poe, you knew his name and you probably didn't know who Rufus Wilmar- Wilmot Griswold was before we started this. Well, I know who so. Grindelwald is. Grindelwald? Yeah. 
Okay, we'll just call him Grindelwald from now on. Despite his ultimately untimely death, Edgar Allan Poe is continued to be celebrated today. Whose death is ever timely? Okay, sure, but, but, no, but no, no, like, old, like, very young. Yeah, but like I get the phrase. It's just like could that phrase pun intended die off okay because like sorry. like not you just generally like here lies steve his death was quite timely <laughs> like, I mean, like, it just doesn't edgar really Allan poe's sense. influence can be seen all over the place in the work of many writers including hp lovecraft mm. arthur conan Co- uh Conan Doyle. I put Coyle here, but I meant Doyle. <laughs> Arthur Conan Coyle. <laughs> I was like, Coyle. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, for those who are familiar. And one of your favorites, Cam, Mr. Stephen King. Stephen King. Poe's writing continues to be a source of inspiration for writers, artists, and filmmakers. And of course, as we said earlier, we highly recommend you watch Pale Blue Eye on Netflix, which is not a biography of any sort of Edgar Allan Poe. It simply just has him as a character. A sidekick. Yes. To and Christian it, Bale. It's a very, it, it, we thought it was a very good movie. You know, Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes do not agree. Didn't well, do very well. Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes are. I usually disagree with them completely. Full of stinky poops now. They used to be, ever since what's his name, it's even, does, does, what's his name, uh, uh, Roger Ebert. I don't think he's like Ebert and, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the other one's name. Both wonderful critics. But ever since I think one of them passed away, I don't know if I'm not sure if the other one's alive still. Mm-hmm. Um, but ever since they kind of, you know, went the way of the the every person in history, um, I almost said went the way of a bird. Um, uh, he they uh, they just kind of gone downhill. I don't trust any of them anymore. Like critic companies, no offense, they're always off base. So take it from us and not Rotten Tomatoes. We it's an enjoyable it movie. Is it's worth it's, your time. It's not the best movie I've ever seen, but it's enjoyable. I mean, yeah. it's, it's one of the better ones. I've seen a lot worse on Netflix. Right. I mean, it's better than Thor 3. So that's all I care about. That's my okay. my, my prim- That's my baseline here. But yeah, that is the life of Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, I also, not to mention his actual works, you should read them. They're very good. The first time I ever had any experience reading his stuff, I think I was probably seventh grade maybe i was in middle school and i remember in my language arts class we had to read the telltale tall tale heart yeah and i was like whoa this is crazy yeah he he's up there like I, i'd love to talk about hp lovecraft uh mm-hmm. and uh dostoevsky would be an interesting mm-hmm. one but the next person we're going to talk about is jack parsons uh per recommendation from one of our viewers mm-hmm. i did not write down their username wow <sighs> too bad now I need to, I need to, you know, make up some time while you uh, try to find it. Yeah, just just, really, just riff, riff real fast. Riff, riff, riff. Tell us why you like Edgar Allan Poe. I also think, I did not mention exactly what he looked like, but he had a very distinct look about him. He had this mustache, he had this swoopy dark hair, and apparently he was a very well-dressed man. So, you know, I got to applaud that. There's nothing better than a well-dressed man. You know, they say a man in uniform. There's something to be said about like an 1800s dapper look. Like I know we've talked about, I really like to play Red Dead Redemption 2 and my character, my uh, Arthur Morgan character, I'm currently buying him an outfit right now that is basically essentially a suit like what I'm talking about. So uh, user Mark Yono, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, yeah, we are taking his suggestion. So we're going to talk about Jack Parsons. Um Mark may never see this, but, you know, thought I would uh, give him a shout out. Good suggestion. Thank you. Um, We'll talk about him. And for anyone else listening or viewing, uh, if you are feeling frisky, you can go ahead and leave us some suggestions, comments, your opinion, or anyone you would like us to talk about. I believe you can also leave it in the comments on Spotify as well. So uh, as long as they're deceased. Leave us a review. Yes, please. A five-star review would be great. Preferably. uh, As long as the person is deceased. Uh, we'll that is our only, well, there's also other merits. I mean, I don't want to talk about like <laughs> someone who is specifically known for how many wasn's they wed, but like with that being said, like I do think that, you know, suggestions are greatly appreciated. It gives us things to create and build off of. And on top of that, it also gives us a way to further connect with you guys. Um, but yeah, hopefully you like the episode. Anything else to add, Jen? No, that was great. Again, uh, if you happen to like our content, you can find it on uh, Instagram. I almost had an aneurysm there. Uh, at History Out of the Box. 
put it right down there. And then additionally, I didn't ask for a subscription earlier. It would be wonderful if you could subscribe. Uh, if you happen to like the content, only if you did happen to like the content. Otherwise, I mean, we want to provide you value. So any suggestions otherwise would be great. So if you didn't like it, tell us why. That way we can uh, get better, stronger, faster. Kanye. Don't reference Kanye right now. I can reference him whenever I want to. Okay, mm-hmm. His legacy one day will be talked about on this podcast. Hopefully not soon. <laughs> <laughs> this will be a generational podcast that we pass down to our children. He's and got a lot of good, bad, bad and ugly. That would be about. a very interesting episode. Oh, yeah. um, and maybe one day we, we add in people who are alive. I don't know how that would work. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe not. But uh, yeah, it Thank was a good episode. Everyone. I am not a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. I'm a fan of his work, but I'm not a fan of the guy. Mm-hmm. Kind of a weirdo. It's all right. Um, But yeah, thanks again, and we will see you next week. Bye.